Okay, good evening. Jonathan, are we on? Okay, very good. Welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church, evening service, the 29th, right? May. Got the day and the month right. There you go. Took me all day to get that. <laughs> uh, glad to have everyone back, um, uh, or everyone who's here back. Um, I'm not going to go over the announcements from the morning. Uh, I don't think I need to, unless some, uh, they're, they're on the back. I didn't do any that I think that were not on the back of the bulletin, other than Wendy's pitch for summer helpers for what will be the Sunday school hour for children, but will be like a, a, a sort of an extended vacation Bible school. So if you've got an interest in helping the, with the children uh, next door during the Sunday school hour, uh, talk to Wendy and um, she'll put you to work. Right? Right. So it might be singing, it might be a craft, it might be a who knows what. Right. And she doesn't know either. <laughs> That's good. We're glad for Wendy to do that and uh, she'll need helpers. All right, uh, that, uh, with, uh, unless there's something uh, somebody else knows I should say, uh, we're going to join with the Lord here. What? Oh, sorry. Uh, for your information, the talent night that would be in June is going to be postponed to the second Friday night of July. So that's July 8th. Um, just to kind of figure people are probably out of town, possibly still this early part of June. Okay, good. Thanks for telling me. So, 6.30. So, talent night has been moved. It would have been in June. It's going to be July the 8th. Is that a Friday? Yeah, Friday. Friday night, July the 8th, 6.30. So, hone your talent. And we're doing it a little bit earlier to uh, hopefully make it easier for uh, families with younger kids. Right. So, this is going to be tried to be geared more towards young kids if you... Right. So if they want to get their if they want to get their recorder routine yeah. ready, right. yeah, yeah, I've been to those nights, eight recorder versions of Mary Had a Little Lamb. That's yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, let's. Uh, uh, so for our evening service, we're going to be working from Psalm 148, and we would be singing it, except that we just sang it a, a couple weeks ago. So uh, one of the versions in the book is really really uh, good. But we're going to look at. Um, Psalm 148, so I'll use that to open us. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. So we're going to sing praise to God. Uh, first three verses of 104a. 104a. Uh, you'll recognize uh, uh, Beethoven's uh, melody. And so we'll stand and sing verses 1, 2, and 3.
have a seat. Have you, uh, hold on to your hymn book, though. We, we have a confessional reading uh, from the back. It's, uh, it's the Confession of Faith this time, chapter 8, the first paragraph. The page back there is 924. Nine twenty-four. <clears throat> so we'll just do the first paragraph, of chapter eight, on Christ the Mediator. So, chapter eight, paragraph one. It pleased God, in His eternal purpose, to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, His only begotten Son, to be the mediator between God and man, the Prophet, Priest, and King the head and savior of his church, the heir of all things, and judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed, to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. That will bear on what we're doing in Psalm 148, believe it or not, a little, uh, a little later. Let me take, uh, this time we take a special uh, note of prayer uh, needs. I've got quite a list. I'm going to run through these just so we don't have to repeat ourselves. Um, but I want you to add to them uh, as, you're, as you have knowledge of them. Uh, Doug, I mentioned this morning Doug Duggan has, uh, tri- has gotten COVID. So that puts Teresa at some risk. And her health is poor. Sue Lantrip, <coughs> Teresa, of course. Um, John uh, Tolson. Uh, I mentioned, I, I think we mentioned the Dickersons. Uh, uh, Terrence's uh, sister died. She was only in her 30s. That's uh, uh, last week uh, in Jacksonville. Ruth Kyle and Bill Mendenhall and Donna Bryant, all three with uh, uh, sight problems. Um, uh, Donna, fairly close to, to uh, blind. Steve Wilder, still struggling. He's to have, I think, on Tuesday, he is to have. Um, what they call it? MUA, manipulation under, an, under anesthesia. He used to have that knee forcibly bent to try to get, uh, he has very little uh, flexion. Flex, that's what it is, yeah. So, <clears throat> so be in prayer for Steve. There's a lot of pain involved right now, and uh, he's really not happy. So, and there's some danger in this uh, procedure uh, as well. So just be in prayer for him and the doctors. Uh, Debbie Davis's mom is doing a lot better. Um, Jen Davis, I did not see Bud this morning, so I'm not sure about Jen, but the last report I had was not, no change. Still looking, is that still right, Sharon? No. Yeah, okay. So she still has this balance problem without a, without a, a solution, and the, the, she's been, been to neurologists and had tests. Mike's got a procedure on Wednesday for a, a pretty significant problem in a leg that's, uh, they have to actually uh, decide what uh, if, if it's really what they think it is, right? So that's that's for Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, okay. Um, we had a lot of visitors this morning. I wrote down a list of names. Quite a few visitors. I hope you had a chance to speak to them. Some of them uh, invited by our members, and some of them from out of town. Uh, had some people from Canada who come here about every two or three years. Young young folks. Uh, it was nice to see. Uh, some of them I remember. Um, if Betty was Betty, they're getting ready to leave on their trip, but if Betty was here, she'd uh, ask for prayer for the persecuted church and their persecutors, which is uh, sometimes we don't do that. And I think that's a mistake on our part because uh, the Apostle Paul was a dreadful persecutor. And somebody, uh, uh, I should have been praying for him, uh, but, and, and, and the Lord uh, rescued him. So we ought to assume the possibility that God can save anyone, including uh, even uh, persecutors. I ought to pray for Bullet. I don't know if he's started back already from uh, from uh, oh, from Orlando, and I don't know. I haven't heard any report from him. He may is he still meeting with them tonight? I yeah, yeah. I was wondering if he wants to stay for an evening service. Okay, so the the committee was to stay for the evening service uh, at Reformation uh, Church. So pray for the fruit of that meeting, uh, and uh, and just for the. Um, the peace and harmony in the congregation as they work through some pretty hard, uh, hard times. Um, the Jenkins are the first people they're going to see are the Rohrbaws 
And Aurobas, I don't know if people know, they've already left for their home in North Carolina in the mountains. So the, uh, the Chingans will be staying with them for a stretch. Um, <clears throat> and traveling mercies, of course, for them. OPC missionaries, we, on Wednesdays when we have this prayer time, we're not online. And so we're able to mention our, pres our missionaries in, by name, but we're not allowed to do that uh, when we're online, just as, because of the security problem. <clears throat> all around the world now. So, uh, but be in prayer for our missions. The OPC has missionaries on most continents. Not a lot of people, but we have uh, families in a lot of places. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we need to pray for them, their safety in some of the countries, and also for their faithfulness and the fruit of their labors. Uh, that's what I had. I'll take more requests. Marianne. Oh yeah, right, sorry. So uh, Marianne's sister Sarah is handling their, their mother's estate. She just died, what, last month, month before? November. November, oh gosh. Okay, so she's handling estate issues which involve, involve stuff in, not just in D.C., but also in Texas, yeah, okay. <clears throat> All right, uh, Sharon. Yeah, so, um, you know, <clears throat> um, in, uh, I want to say it's Uvalde, is that the, that the name of the place? Um, these, are, these are opportunities, uh, you know, uh, for people to think about eternity. Uh, some, uh, of course, in the, in the way the news handles it, there is no such thing as eternity, and so it's something to make you mad. Uh, but, uh, you know, when, there's a time in Luke, uh, two occasions in Luke 13, where he is brought, is brought to his attention that there have been a couple of local tragedies. Uh, and he says, uh, so why did those things not happen to you? Beware. Uh, because uh, uh, t time is short. Uh, and one, one of the problems we have, you know, would those children be dead in 50, 60, 70 years from now? Certainly. Because we're all going to die. I mean, it's a tragedy that they died early. But we need to be aware that death is something we all have in common. Uh, and meeting the Lord Jesus is also something every person has in common. That's point, point this morning in the, in the text. So we need to be thinking uh, about, uh, uh, and so, so there's a lot of mission work. One, uh, one of the columnists in the journal mentioned that the churches were full. Uh, all sorts of churches, people going to meet God uh, as well as they might. That's a, that's a, that is a, I mean, the media, only, it's only a Christian columnist in the Wall Street Journal mentioned it, but the point is, there, are, uh, there, there, is, there, is, there is an answer. His name is Jesus. Uh, and uh, now, there are all sorts of other problems to do with these, this kind of violence in our society. We, are, we live in a very violent world. But look at the world of the Bible. And in fact, the illustration Jesus uses was uh, a, a dreadful thing that Pilate, uh, he, he, he despised the Jews, and something he did to some, uh, there was a, some sort of a minor rebellion in the city, and he, uh, he, he was uh, uh, over-the-top brutal. In, in fact, uh, he was eventually removed and committed suicide uh, 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 over his, but all, all of it over his brutality. He, 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 was a, uh, he was a man who hated human beings. And how many leaders in the world today do we notice? <coughs> have no sense of value of human life. But we, we know that human life doesn't end at death, right? That's what the Stoics and the Epicureans thought. Human life ends at death, have a nice time. But that's not true. That's not true. So we need to be attentive to those kind of things, praying for those families, praying that the Lord would move in, those, uh, in that community uh, and bring to real life uh, the people who are there. You know? Sorry for that long-winded thing. Stephen. Yeah, right. Yeah, so uh, to re I'm trying to repeat these so, so the people online can hear them. Uh, this is Memorial uh, Day, a, a weekend, a holiday. But at a time when we remember those who have uh, uh, served, 
uh, out of their families, away, some uh, uh, badly wounded or harmed mentally or physically, and then uh, many died in, uh, in lots of places uh, because their country called on them. And so we ought to remember, uh, <clears throat> all you, you don't have to travel. If you haven't traveled much, you, you can simply read about all the places in the world where what we take for granted would be a, a beyond a luxury. I mean, I've lived in places where going to church, you have to pass by people with guns to do it, and you know they're watching to see what you're doing. And then there are some places, uh, Muslim countries, China, where going to church is a positively risky venture. In Muslim countries, like some of our allies, like Saudi Arabia, it's illegal. You don't go. You don't get to have a Bible, you can't go. You, if you get found with one, you're in trouble. And your family can actually put you to death legally. So you have, you have places in the world where being a Christian is, uh, you can't say impossible, but uh, it's, it's certainly dangerous. So we ought to be aware of the fabulous privileges that we have in this land. Oh, Jonathan, sorry. Uh, praise that I got promoted to bar back at CAPS. Oh, Jonathan got a, a promotion at, at CAPS. So you're, are you co-owner? <laughs> not that far, oh sorry, not that far up. All right, so Jonathan's uh, somewhere from down, down further down the ladder. Yeah, but better than before. Better money than before. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, we're glad to hear that. <clears throat> okay. Okay, Wendy's, well, tell me the relationship though. My nephews. Nephew, right, sorry. Wendy's nephew's in-laws, her mother, his mother-in-law, okay, died of cancer. So just prayer for that, uh, that uh, part of her family. Yeah, comfort, right. Believer? Oh yeah? Oh, swell. All right. Uh, pass. You know, uh, death for unbelievers is the punishment for violating the covenant of works. Death for a believer is passing to glory. I mean, the death is the same, but what happens in the death is as different as night and day. So. Okay. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah, I have my two grandsons coming for the week. They, um, they call me Captain Spell Captain. And I'm just going to be teaching them about those six days of creation. And their mother, which is my daughter, is not a believer, so they don't hear that. And I just kind of want to have the Hmm. Okay, so Tracy has two grandsons coming for the, the week, and she's going to teach them about the Lord, which, whom they do not know. Right. How old are these boys? Eight and five. Eight and five. So we pray that the Lord open their eyes and their ears, yeah? Yeah, Venus. I got a note from somebody I forgot to look at. Okay. All right. Okay. So Venus is mom's brother and nephew. No. Okay. All right. So three members of Venus's family need a place to live. Yeah. Okay. All right, now I got handed a note, apologies. Healing for people that are ill mentally and spiritually uh, or that are injured. Okay, it's from Shetasia, all right. And for marriages to be strengthened. Okay, yes. I'm going to turn them way up. Hold on a second. Hold on, Venus. I can't hear you. Go up the ladder here. Yes. Surrender, repentance, and just unity for the church. Okay. And what was it for the church? Surrender, repentance, repentance and, and unity. And unity. Unity. Thank you. Sorry. All right. And also for Adele and Anthony, the new family that came from Adele. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Anthony and Adele. Adele. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, we had a number of visitors this morning, friend, uh, friends of uh, people that um, Venus met and invited to church. Anthony and his mom, Adele, to pray for them. And then she pr- wanted us to pray for unity, surrender, Repent. and repentance. Everybody needs those. Okay, let's pray together. Father in heaven, uh, your name, O Lord, is very great. We're going to talk about it a little bit today, tonight. And it's because you are who you say you are uh, that we, O Lord, have uh, free uh, access through the blood of Christ into your presence, the very throne room of glory. Angels, O Lord God, uh, find it a, a thrilling, even challenging experience to be that close, to be near to you. And yet we are invited, O Lord God, uh, as the crown of your creation, more precious than the angels, uh, to come into your presence. And we pray, O Lord, that as we do that, we would be attentive to your holiness, uh, wisdom, power, kindness, mercy. And that when we pray and ask you for things, we would do that, Lord, as a small child would ask a powerful, loving father. So that we might, O Lord, put matters in your hands as we see them, knowing, O Lord God, that you see them better than we do, know them better than we do, and know precisely what is the thing that needs doing. Uh, And then, O Lord, the mystery of how you use prayers to work out your purposes in the world, we leave that, O Lord, alone, as we don't know the answer to that most uh, uh, interesting but uh, um, uh, impossible uh, thing. Lord, we then uh, ask all these things that have been mentioned, Doug and Sue and uh, Terrence's family, uh, Teresa, uh, John Tolson, Ruth and Bill and Donna and their sight, Steve Wilder and this uh, upcoming procedure to try to fix his leg, Mike's the same thing, Jen Davis, uh, an unknown problem uh, to do with her uh, inability really to stand and walk. The praise Lord, we have the good things we hear about Debbie's, um, um, Debbie Davis' mom. Lord, the, the uh, dreadful things in, uh, in uh, Reformation Church in Oviedo, and uh, Lord, our, our pastor and uh, two others working with them to try to be sure that, uh, it, that oh Lord, uh, what could be done humanly is being done, and that greater uh, prayers are being offered uh, both for the minister who left and for the people. Lord, we pray your mercies uh, would be upon them, that we would be a forgiving and a reconciling people, even as you are a forgiving and reconciling God. We pray for uh, our visitors this morning, thinking of uh, uh, the couple that uh, Venus in, in, invited, uh, Anthony, his mom, Adele, and uh, there were others, oh Lord, with glad to have uh, neighbors of mine, although I didn't invite them, uh, Kent and some friends of his. We pray your blessings on all these. Uh, Susan's sister, and uh, Lord, we're thankful for them, uh, and uh, pray that you would uh, bless them uh, in their in, uh, uh, their participation with us in worship. Might it have been a blessing for them, and we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, that you would keep them close to you, even as we hope that for ourselves. As Venus says, unity, and it comes through uh, ordinarily comes through repentance. Uh, and surrender to you. Pray your blessings would be upon us, O Lord, that we would be before you night and day. Uh, And in the words of a famous uh, Old Testament scholar, uh, that uh, we would find ourselves often preoccupied uh, with God. It would be a good thing, O Lord, for us to devote ourselves more uh, more and more to you. Pray for uh, Mary Ann's sister, for wisdom, and uh, for Sarah in handling the family's affairs. Pray for all those families, O Lord, in Uvalde, Texas, O Lord, that you might draw near and cause uh, the word of the gospel, as people might have occasion to hear it, to prosper, run in their hearts, and Lord, that might people find, O Lord, a hope in heaven that overturns their fears uh, and sadness in the world. Pray for Jonathan. We pray, Lord, he'd be a faithful worker. We're thankful for the news that he is, it has been so and is a, and a promotion. We're thankful for that. And, O oh Lord, we pray for Tracy and these two little boys that they might come to know and eventually, O oh Lord, at some point come to love uh, the Savior of sinners. O oh Lord, might you be pleased to bless her with winsomeness and faithfulness in, in her conversations with these little fellows. 
And as we pray, Lord, for Wendy, uh, her family, the nephews, uh, uh, mother-in-law's uh, uh, death to cancer. Pray, Lord, for that family. Uh, she was evidently a believer, so we pray, oh Lord, for comfort uh, that uh, this life is not the end uh, for anyone, but especially for uh, those who know Christ. It is, death is but the beginning of a lifetime of uh, faithful love and service uh, to the Savior of sinners. Pray, oh Lord, we might all be reminded of that fact. In all this, O oh Lord, we ask you to bless, guard, and keep your people wherever you find them, in our mission works around the world. O oh Lord, hold them, hold them all harmless, all your people, harmless from the evil one and uh, the attacks of wicked uh, men who serve Satan so faithfully. Lord, might we be blessed uh, uh, in, your, uh, in your protection. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. So before we uh, look, we're going to uh, sing a song about the Word of God. It's 271. 271. For some reason, the bulletin shows that one is standing and the last hymn is seated, but that's backwards. So we're going to stay seated at 271, and then hopefully I'll remember to have you stand at 291. Nobody could sit down to sing that hymn anyway. So we're at 271 now, and we'll remain uh, seated. Anytime in the hymn book you see Catherine Winkworth's name, she devoted her whole life to learning German so that she could translate the greatest hymns of the Lutheran Church for the English Anglican hymn books. And so lots of fabulous hymns have come to us because of that. that was her whole life's work, have come to us in her work. She had to learn the German and then German poetry and immerse herself in that, uh, and so brought these hymns. Uh, to us. So if you ever see her name in a book, and she's in lots of hymn books many times, it's because that was her life's work to bring hymns to us that otherwise we would have no uh, knowledge of, and to translate them in a way that they could be sung. And if you, you just go through the words of that, it's a beautiful hymn, and not that easy to translate a hymn from one language to another and catch the, both the sense and rhyme, meter, all that. Anyway, there's that. Okay, so Psalm 148. Psalm 148. Yes, you may stand. So I, I know this morning I threw you a curve. I may I'm 
gave a little, uh, <coughs> I had a little background, but I'm not doing much background, just a little tiny bit, so we'll just go ahead and read it first. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. And He established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy winds fulfilling His word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints. For the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, we're going to turn our attention to a brief exposition of this beautiful song. Pray, O oh Lord, we might grow in our appreciation for the beauty of this often sung hymn and for the sentiment uh, which captures uh, not only uh, uh, the themes, the grand themes of creation and providence, but a great deal more as well. Pray your blessings on us in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so you'll you'll reckon, you can sit down. Sorry. <laughs> so you'll recognize you'll recognize the hymn. You know, let them praise and give Jehovah for His name alone is. Da, da, da. Anyway, that's the hymn, but we sang it recently, so I. Couldn't do it. Too bad. So, Psalm 148. The, one of the uh, 19th, uh, 20th century commentators said about this psalm, um, this is a psalm about being preoccupied with God. Uh, and I mentioned that about Jesus because, you know, you could say anything to him. And you, what, you read, if you read the gospel record uh, and listen to people talking to him, he had a God answer for everything. He, he didn't say yes. He just, just didn't react to things, I think, the way, certainly the way I do, the way we often do. He thought of everything as reflecting back on the government of his father. And, and um, th this is one of those psalms. And uh, the way to think about it, uh, I think, is, um, is to think about a psalm like this in light of distractions. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm about the easiest person to be distracted that there is. I mean, give me a hangnail, and I am off my feet. I mean, I just, you know, I'm looking for clippers, I'm looking for something, you know, and it's always when you're driving the car. Or, but go all the way up the ladder. Go to the Uvalde crisis. And how many of us, when we first saw the news as it was unfolding that day, were thinking about God and the glories of heaven and what, I wasn't. Maybe you were. God bless you if you were. I wasn't. It took a little while for me to get out of the things of this world and back into the things of God. But you never find the Savior having trouble, as the examples in Luke 13. He always, he always was thinking, what does this mean to my Father? What is He doing? Well, that, this psalm is a little like that. And uh, I, I want to uh, you know, walk you through it pretty briefly. It's, it, uh, it, you know, in, in uh, the nice uh, version of it that we have, uh, there are several versions in this hymn book, but the one that most of us know um, um, has the kind of joy in the melody that, that captures, captures this, uh, this thing. So there are several obvious points. It begins with uh, six verses on... Uh, creation. Uh, you, you know, everyone who lives, every, every child uh, uh, of man living on the earth now and ever uh, owes God complete allegiance because they were created by Him. If, if somebody makes something, you, this is easy when you can teach a child this in two seconds. If they make something and you ask, you reach your hand out and say, let me have that. 
they're going to say to you, no, it's mine. How did it get to be theirs? Their instinct tells them they made it, it's theirs. I mean, I wouldn't tell them it's not theirs. That's exactly what the Bible says. God made everything and it's His. He owns everything. And so people who are created by God owe Him absent any other matter. They owe Him their complete and total allegiance. We call that the covenant of works, right? They were put on this earth by Him to serve Him. And if you say they don't know that, you be careful because Romans 1 says, yes siree, everybody knows there's a God. The people can tell you, you know, the only people who say there's no God are professors in state universities. Uh, probably some private universities too, but they, they, they will claim, but they don't really believe that. Bullet often uh, refers to atheists who say things stupid like, I hope there's no, I don't believe there is a God, at least I hope there's not. You know, and, and that's the sort of thing, you know, uh, because why? Inside of them, what Paul says is true. Everybody has an instinct. Somebody did this. Somebody's behind all this. You know, whether you're into arguments for, for God from, uh, from order or from moral uh, sensibilities that all humans have. There's lots of arguments for God. But whatever, whatever uh, tickles you, the truth is that everybody has some instinct that there's a God. And of course the danger for those people is obvious. If there is a God, what if He has an opinion? See, that's the danger. And the instinct we have is, I bet he does. Everybody has that. All right, so, so in, the first, in the first instance, the, the psalmist tells us everyone, everyone owes God uh, a salute, a salutation. Uh, praise God. That's what this is, right? Okay, so that's the first point. Now, that's pretty straightforward, but it's useful to remember that it's not just you know, 25, 20 people out on Sunday night who, oh God, this room should be jam-packed. And every other church, in a sense, should be jam-packed with people who believe that there is a God, that He made them, and that they owe Him everything. And, you know, the number of people in, America, in our land where you're completely free to do as you please, most people do as they please. Uh, and so churches are, what is it? Uh, if, uh, well, I think the last time I saw a number, if 10% of Americans went to church, there wouldn't be any seats. The church would be overwhelmed. In spite of the fact that you see polls and 90% of the people say they believe in God, all you got to do is ask them a couple more questions and you realize <clears throat> no, nobody's into this. That's just the way it is. Uh, they don't treat God uh, as He deserves. Second thing, providence. So from 7 to 12, the verses, he moves from creation to the fact that God's running the show. We looked a little bit at that this morning in Sunday school. God runs the show. Stormy winds fulfilling His Word. <laughs> it's an interesting expression, you know, a poetic expression. Even the winds obey God. So if a hurricane comes, if that one in the, in the Pacific comes across the Yucatan Peninsula and comes our way, who's in charge? God is. He rules the waves. Now, even, you know, even people who aren't big on the sovereignty of God do that. Where, where people who aren't big on the sovereignty of God get weak need is when it comes to sovereignty over people. They don't mind God running wind and waves as long as the wind and waves don't get nearby. Right? But the truth is, that from the Scripture's point of view, everything He made, He runs. They are at His disposal. Now, if you say, well, I don't understand what he means by those things, well, don't ask me. I don't either. All things, are, all things uh, blend together to bring glory to Christ. But remember, this is a fallen world. And God is using a lot of evil things to bring about greater glory to himself. But how he does that, what mechanisms he uses, how we understand the events themselves, he's not telling. That's just the way it is. You have to, sometimes, you know, we have to bow the knee before God and say, I believe it. I don't understand it, but Lord, I know you're in charge. Okay, well, so all these things uh, we're supposed to, and <clears throat> high and low, people are supposed to acknowledge these things. So kings and old men and children. 
You know, kings are the powerful, old men and children are the least, right? Those of us who are old know what, what the psalmist means. And we're no longer of interest, no one asks, no one asks an old person their opinion of anything. You know, if I, I this is an easy illustration, I'll pick on myself. If I tell, if I give advice to one of my grandsons, oh, Papa, I mean, what does an old guy know? I say, look, I, I was your size, age, etc. I've been there, done that. Uh, Papa. Oh. But that's the way it was in Scripture. That, that's exactly the point. Children don't understand. Old men, they don't get it either. On the other side of that phrase, kings and princes, they get it. How else did they get those great jobs? But all these people owe God thanks and praise for his creation and the fact that he's running the world. We haven't gotten to Jesus. Before you get to any of the stuff about redemption, human beings owe God praise. This is not the only place that says it, but it's pretty plain, uh, plainly run out here. And then, then uh, four or five things, five things are said at the end about God that are different from the earlier. The first thing that said, this is all in verse 13 and 14, because that's where the key, for our, from our point of view, the key uh, lies. The first thing, it has mentioned the name of the Lord already twice, and in 13 he's mentioned twice. His name alone, only, there's an emphasis in Hebrew, his name alone is to be exalted. His name. Now, from our point of view, he has a name. It's not God. It's Yahweh, right? Or Jehovah. Yahweh would be the way it probably was pronounced. Moses was given the name of God as a particular thing. You may remember in Exodus 3, he'd been given a job to go back to, to uh, tell the Israelites that God was sending him to bring them out of Egypt. And he said, you know, and of course, you remember Moses was not exactly enthusiastic about the job. And he said, you know... Oh, wrong guy. I'm not very, not much of a spokesman. Wrong guy. And that didn't play. So then he said, well, you know, when I get there, who do I tell him sent me? And God said, you tell him I am sent you. So the, the name that God gives himself, is that is my name. His name is, um, I am the pre-existent one. I am the, I am, uh, I am the one who was before everything. You know, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God, right? So he tells Moses that's his name. It's repeated again in chapter 6. And then uh, in a most magnificent way, when Moses is trying to deal with God one-on-one, -on -one, top of the mountain, people of Israel have had a fabulous party while Moses is getting the law of God, the first time that the law has always been there, but the first time it's been written down. Uh, and uh, God hears a sound. What is that sound I hear? There are a lot of great lines in that. At any rate, to, to, we'll cut the story short. You know that the God uh, presses, and Moses presses back. God says, get out of the way. I'm going to make, I'm going to make, I'm going to destroy them. And I'll make a new people out of you. So Moses offered, offered the opportunity to be the new Abraham, father of the people of God. And Moses says, Lord... They're not my people. They're your people, and they carry your name. And what happens to them is going to besmirch your reputation if you do what you're talking about. All of history will say, he brought them out here to put them down. Uh, and pleading on the reputation of God, God, God. Okay, I'll go with you. Moses, Moses presses. I've always thought it was the most amazing thing. Chapter 34, Moses says, I'm in chapter 33, Moses says, show me your glory. Show me yourself. Uh, and, uh, you know, it runs, uh, I usually mention this without, without doing it. Show me your glory. I am going to make all my goodness pass before you. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make all my goodness. You read Psalm 100. Um, you know, come into his presence with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. For the, uh, Be thankful to him because the Lord is good. Colon, or it should have a colon. 
His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. That's the goodness of God. I'm going to make my goodness pass before you. My name, the Lord. And so then he takes him up on the top of the mountain, remember? <clears throat> and the Lord passes by Moses. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Those are the two terms. Abounding in. Steadfast love is God's permanent loyalty to his people. And faithfulness is his permanent loyalty to himself and his own word. And that's the character. That's the goodness of God. Right? And so whenever we hear the name Yahweh, the Lord, when it's in the Old Testament, when it's in caps, when it's Lord like that, and you know that's the name, that's the character of God as all steadfast love, keeping steadfast love for generations, and still yet punishing the guilty. So back to, back to 148. So his name, his character, of all the names, of all the characters, his alone is to be exalted and praised. I don't have to. How many things do we praise in the world? <clears throat> when was the last time you heard us? This is the easiest illustration I can think of. When was the last time you heard a sports commentator say something like, What an awesome play! What a fantastic thing! No comment, Mark. <laughs> because you know what's happened to us, and I do it too, we all use the vocabulary of glory for something like a guy who caught a football or ran a little faster than somebody and got away from him and got into the end zone or hit a ball 620 feet, which you're not supposed to be able to do. Or, you know, we, we use the vocabulary of God to try to emphasize the greatness of man or something that we saw. It's, it's just an instinct with us. It's God's word, it's God's things, and that's what we do. But his name alone, his name alone is to be exalted. I, I just use that illustration to show you how we all exalt man for sometimes things that are, you know, when was the last time you saw a child do something, you know, nice? And instead of saying, wow, that's very nice. That is stupendous. That's the greatest thing I've ever seen. Not. Because we, 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 we just use God's words in a way that's really not. Well, anyway, so there's the first one. Second, he has raised up a horn. It's a, it, this is an odd idea. It's through, it's a lot in the Old Testament. You know, uh, oxen, which is the, the scariest animal in, uh, in Old Testament times, in where they live, they have big horns. Uh, and that's the way those big animals kill people, right? They use those horns. So the word horn, actually more like, more than literal, is used metaphorically for strength, for power. The first person I can find uh, in Scripture who uses the idea of the, the Lord is the, the strong, that he's the horn, is twice in a, young, in a little girl's song. First verse and the last verse of Hannah's song. She talks about the horn of the Lord. She rejoices in the strength of God. Remember that was her, no child, weeping in the temple before the Lord. Elkanah's watching her, and he thinks this, nothing's going to come out of this. Who, who is this? And that who was? So, so, so she somehow introduces us to this idea of the Lord being the strength uh, of the people. Now, from there, uh, in, in 2 Samuel, David, it, it becomes, it's Psalm, it's uh, 2 Samuel 22, but it becomes Psalm 18. And David opens with, he's my refuge, he's my strength, he is the horn of my salvation. He is the strength that stands behind me. And then uh, Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, when he learns from the angel what God is going to do, through, the, through his forerunner for the new Messiah, Zechariah. He talks, about, he talks about the Savior, quoting David, who was quoting Hannah. He quotes, the Lord is the horn, the strength of his people. 
And so that's that, and that is picked up in the Revelation uh, uh, later on as well. That Jesus Christ, He Himself, is the strength uh, of His people. Well, uh, so there you have that one. Let's try another one. His people. Now, you, you go right by His people, right? You read His people. Well, of course, His people. When did, when, did, when did people become His people? When did we become His people as opposed to the people or the nations? Because we're not called the nations. Uh, we were brought out of the nations to become his people. Uh, and his people comes from Genesis chapter 12. First, Abraham is told, I'm going to make you. I'm going to make you into a mighty people. Those who love you, I'll love. And those who don't, I won't either. But many people in the world are going to be blessed through you. And then a couple chapters later in chapter 17 when he gives him the sign of circumcision as the marker of, of identity, he tells him, I am going to be your God and you're going to be my people. And so all through the scripture after that, Old Testament then in the New, the notion is that God has a special people. They were started from one Chaldean nobody. From Ur of the Chaldees, an absolute nobody. And out of that one man and his, and his uh, uh, old wife, God has made a people who are routinely called his people. And the horn of his people, as we'll see in a second, will become the Lord Jesus Christ. God, God himself will be the savior, will be the strength of his people. What will be different between God's people and all the other folks in the world will be not, as Moses once told the Israelites, it's not, not being smart. It's not being numerous. It's not any of the things that men rejoice in. David was once warned, don't, don't be counting horses and chariots, friend, because that's not where your strength, your horn, can be found. It's, it's God. The Lord himself is the horn of his people. And his people are then called saints. You know, the saint is the word... Uh, holy ones, hagios, they're the holy ones, the hagioi of God. S uh, its original sense is, is set apart, distinguished. Not distinguished, be careful, we are not distinguished in ourselves so much as we are distinguished in our Lord, right? Because the truth is, if you take all of us out and set us next to an, uh, a bunch of other people, some of them are nicer, kinder, prettier, smarter, but if they're not his people, they're nobody, right? What's distinctive about us is that we are his saints set apart to be his people. And then the last thing uh, I said about his people uh, is this notion at the end, near to him. We've been brought near, an expression often in scripture, we've been brought near. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon, in his little commentary, he has a commentary on all the Psalms, he says, how close, how close is near? Think about it for a second. How close is near? We are his people. He's brought us near. What is, what is near? And Spurgeon has it. Union with Christ. We are united to God in his family. This morning, looking at uh, our identity. We, we have, you know, we've got justification, we have sanctification, you know, but we have adoption. We've been brought into his family, united to Christ. That's how near we are to God. He has united us to his son. And so, if you think about it, if you're united to someone, you would say it this way, or I would say it this way. Where he goes, we go. What he loves, we love. What he hates, we hate. Paul's funny expression, we come to have the mind of Christ. Christ is all in all. Let's think of all the expressions. And so the psalm finishes by saying that we, have, we, we, we will be near to him, not just now, of course, but, for, uh, but we learn in the New Testament, we'll be near to him forever. Now think, think uh, 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 go back to the beginning of the psalm. There's a, there was a famous commentator, of, of, well, he did, he actually 
preached and wrote out sermons on the whole of Scripture, but he's famous for his commentary on the Psalms. He was a Scotsman, but he pastored in England uh, for many, many years, last century, Alexander McLaren. <clears throat> we go back to creation. Who brought tragedy to creation? When creation went sour, when it went south, as we say it, who did that? Adam did that. We did that. We ruined creation. It was all good when God made it. And two chapters later, it's trashed. But a man solved the problem that a man made. It had to be that way, right? First man ruined it all. But the second man, the Lord Jesus Christ, it, McLaren says about this psalm, here is a prophetic anticipation. It's not just poetic rapture. Here's a summons to the world to rejoice in the Lord because he has taken the vanity of the world and, revert, and, and transformed it back into beauty so that now all creation can be said to praise the Lord. Because the second man is in the business of redeeming. And while you may look at the world and say it doesn't look like it now, you just wait. Because we're waiting for a city not made with hands. A, a special kind of city. A new creation. A new heavens and a new earth. And when the Lord Jesus comes down and refabricates or renews all this, you will say, you'll sing Psalm 148 and you'll see it on, in play every day. The creation will look like it's supposed to look. And everyone will say, let, the, let, the, let all of nature praise Jehovah, for his name alone is high. See? So Jesus, remember Romans 8? All of creation is doing what? Groaning, awaiting its renewal. And the horn will renew it for his people, and they will stay close to him in a new heavens and a new earth. Anyway, there's a psalm that also has a prophetic angle to it. And that's our lesson. Let's sing again. Uh, since I've tried to point us to the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll sing uh, praise to him. 291, and this one we'll stand to. 291, over a thousand tongues to sing.
Father in heaven, thank you for the evening. Thank you for this whole day, O oh Lord, Resurrection Day. Pray, O oh Lord God, that the blessings we have received this day we'd carry uh, into the week, that you might also, Lord, use us uh, to be a blessing both to you and to those we come into contact with. Even, O oh Lord, in our prayers. We ask your mercies in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Thank you.